Well, I'm happy to talk after everyone is having a beer. I hope my talk comes down better then. Um, yeah, I like the party mood that is going on. It's cool. So I'm, I'm going to start by saying that actually I identify myself as a cyborg because I have some implants in my body that allow me to extend my senses beyond, my nat beyond our natural senses. So there are many things that happen around us that we don't perceive because our senses can be very limited. But I learned that if I unite myself with technology, I could uh, perceive things that I cannot normally perceive. But I start from the beginning by saying that actually I'm a, I'm a dancer and a choreographer and a movement researcher. So uh, when I was studying choreography in college, we were encouraged to use technology in our artwork. But actually, I've always been very, not, not very interested in technology itself. I know I'm not in the right context, but I, when I was a teenager, I was actually anti-technology too. I was like, well, I always felt very cold and distant. But in, in my college, we were encouraged to use technology and to use it. And it always felt like when I use it on, on the stage, it would create like a distance or you could see a lot of the tools. So I decided that rather than using technology as a tool, if you use it as part of the dance, it would be a more natural union. And, and also learned that when I was studying movement, I learned that actually there are many things that move around us that we don't perceive. So my aim was to perceive movement in the deepest way I could. And to do that, I did different projects. Uh, my first one was to detect a speed. So I had this kind of a glove, and, uh, and this alarm I would point at people, and then it would tell me the speed of the people walking in front of me. So I would point and then I would, it would say five per hour or three per hour or seven per hour. But that wasn't that cool because first I had to point at people. That was weird. And also it would tell me the speed. The, it would tell me the speed of the people walking. I didn't want to know the speed. I'll keep looking at this. I wanted to feel the speed. So in order to do this, with the help of a friend, we transformed this glove into a pair of earrings. So every every... Everyone, uh, so anyone that was uh, walking in front of me, uh, from right to left, I would feel a vibration on my right ear and then on my left ear. And depending on the interval of each vibration, I would know the speed of the people walking in front of me. So I did that for a while and I could also perceive uh, movement with my eyes closed. And then when I was doing this speed thing of the people, I realized that actually there's a common sense of people walking uh, around us. You would probably, there's like a common movement sense, you would probably walk faster if you are in London than if you are in Rome. And I was fascinated by it. So uh, there's like a tendency to, to, to join the, the movement of the people that we have around. So I decided to do a project, a Ru European project, to go to each capital city of Europe to define the speed of the citizens living in each, in each capital. So to create like a movement dictionary. So I could do like the movement of Paris or the movement of Berlin by defined by the people that live there. So it's another way of defining cities. During, the, during this research, I found out that actually the fastest city is London, as you could imagine. But surprisingly, Stockholm was really fast too. Like people there were very fast, and actually Oslo was not, but they were very chill. I was very fascinated by it. And actually the slowest city I ever been was the Vatican City, mainly. There's just a big line there. No one ever runs in the Vatican City. If someone running, something mu terrible must happen. So what was that, <laughs> that was my research around Europe. After experiencing the speed of the people uh, around me, I decided to turn around my earrings. And, to, and this allowed me to detect the movement that I had behind my body. I don't know if this happens to you, but uh, I, I get really annoyed when in the big cities there's people blocking you and, and you try to go fast and they don't feel you. I don't know, if have, I think everyone should have this sensing behind because I get really annoyed. So <coughs> yeah, and it's actually a sense that also we give to cars. So cars can feel if, if they're going closer to a car, but actually we don't. So maybe in order to, to extend our cars and our phones, maybe we should extend ourselves. So this actually, uh, yeah, I think our senses are very, are very 
a lot a lot of in front of our bodies, but the back of our bodies are very dead sensory sensory speaking. So this opened my my awareness of the space in three three sixty degrees. So if everyone would have this, maybe the ways we move to cities would be very different. Maybe new sports would appear because the way of we perceive space would be different. But yeah, I wore this for a while. And then <coughs> after experiencing the movement, the speed of the movement, the movement that I had behind, I wanted to perceive a more, s a more universal movement, a movement that didn't depend on people and or, or objects. So I thought, if I would be alone in the planet, how could I perceive movement? And then I realized that the Earth is actually moving, not only rotates constantly around the sun and around itself, but it shakes constantly through earthquakes. And I thought it would be fascinating to, to be united to this huge and natural movement, but most of the time imperceptible. So now, since 2013, I've been connected to online seismographs that allows me to perceive the seismic activity of the planet in real time. So I have a couple of implants on my feet. And every time there's, a, there's an earthquake, I feel a vibration. So now I'm here in Malmo, but if there's an earthquake in Chile or in Japan or in Greece, I would feel a vibration inside my body. And depending on the intensity of the earthquake, the vibration feels a stronger or less strong. And I call this the seismic sense, the sense of feeling the, the, um, the movement of the earth in real time. Uh, of course, at the beginning, I had to get used to feeling all these vibrations because the Earth is constantly moving. It's also a, a live organism that keeps evolving and shaking constantly. But so, yeah, like at the beginning, I would wake up more often in the middle of the night because if there would be a, a big earthquake, I would wake up. So I was like waking up by the Earth. But now I'm like I'm, I'm more used to it, so I don't wake up more that often. It works for me because I'm, I I think I sleep very easily, so it works for me. I'm not sure if it works for too many people. And sometimes at the beginning, if I was talking and there was a big earthquake, I would also like stop talking because I would be like, uh, how do you say, like thinking of of the movement of the earth. But after a while, now now it's part of me. And the way that I have to describe it is like I feel like I have two beats now. Apart from my heartbeat, I have the earth beat that it's it's beating in its own own. So I add this extra beat in my body, and I I see this as I work art. I think that now artists we no longer need to use uh, technology as a tool. We can use technology as part of our body and change our experience of reality. So we can design our own perception. Of, of the world, and I see this as, as art. So I, I see that the seismic sense is my artwork, but the thing is that it's an artwork that happens inside the artist. So in the inside work art, the, the, the artwork, the audience, and where it happens, it's all in the, same, in the same pace. So I'm like the audience of my own art. So in order to share what I feel, I create external artwork. It would be like a bit like a photographer that first, that first you see, uh, the photographers usually first see the picture and then they press, and then they decide if to reveal or not that images. So in cyborg art, it's a bit the same. I feel, and then to share, I create external artwork. And one of the works is a dance piece that I call uh, Waiting for Earthquakes, where it's an invitation to the audience just to wait for an earthquake to take place. So it's a bit like a, a waiting room, where we all wait to, it's a, it's a real time based piece, so it can last 10 minutes or it can last hours. And we all just wait in there, and whenever there's an earthquake, I move according to the intensity of the earthquake. So if there are no earthquakes in the, the performance, there will be no dance. And lots of festivals are worried about this, like, what if there's no earthquakes? Like, uh, it's not my fault, it's like the real time thing, no? The, but there's always something, there's always, the earth moves somehow. So in this case, earth is the choreographer of the piece and I'm just interpreting the data that she gives me. Another way, I know this was in, I did also this is in, in Times Square in New York. So I, I used to live there and I did it this series of performing on the street inside this cube and waiting for earthquakes. So it was like people could see how the earth was was moving for some time. Actually, this was like in the middle of the, of the night and a girl lie down just waiting with me, the earthquakes. Another guy stepped into the cube, so I don't know. 
that people interact with the game. Um, oh yeah, I have to tell you this. So, yeah, apart from when you want to become a cyborg, you want to have a new sense, apart from from trying to find out what you want to feel, or what you want to sense, you also have to find out how you want to do it. And the first time I, I perceived the seismic activity was like, I'll just put it on my arm because it was like easy and it was like very, very far from my vital organs. And it and so I first it was here, then I put it up and up. So it didn't annoy me. And then I did the implants in my arms. And then I realized that actually if we humans will have this extra sense of feeling the, s the seismic activity of the planet, it, it would be more logical to feel it on the feet because it's the part of the body that touches the floor. So then I change it and I put it on my feet. But it's like a whole experimentation. I didn't do, do my work of designing the organ. But when I had it on my, on my arm, I created this sculpture. So it's like a 3D version of my arm. And it was uh, exhibited uh, some exhibitions, so the uh, the visitors could touch the arm if, if uh, there was an earthquake in that moment, the arm would vibrate. So it's like a cyborg sculpture because it's a sculpture connected to a living organism, which is the earth in that in that case. Another way that I have to to share what I feel is through percussion. I call this the seismic percussion. So I can play this in two ways. One is also based on real time. So the rhythm of the of the piece is based on the rhythm of the tectonic plates, how they move. And I also do it in in, in another way, which is like I I research all the earthquakes that happen in a specific place. For example, the last I did, uh, it was in, in Brazil some, some weeks ago. So I detected I researched all the all the earthquakes that happened in, in Brazil in the last 50 years and I put them all together in a score that would last around 10 minutes and I would play the this score so the the people from Brazil could hear how the country had been moving the the intensity of of the con how the country had been moving in the last 50 years so in that case earth is the composer of the piece and i'm just interpreting the data also like in 2010 with my childhood friend neil neil and i we founded the cyborg foundation uh, we found it basically with three aims. One was to help humans to become cyborgs. The other one was to defend uh, cyborg art as an artistic movement. And the other one it was to, de to defend cyborg rights, the, the right and the freedom to, to design yourself and your own perception. And actually, uh, two years ago, we presented the first cyborg rights in Southwest Southwest. We have like five now, for example, uh, the uh, like to protect not being hacked or like that the new new body parts uh, are protected as you as a physical not as an, uh, an object and we have like several ones that there are on the website and we think it's a progress like how the rights that we need if uh, with a society that a lot of people unite with with technology but first of all like cyborg comes from the word cybernetic organism and I don't know if you know, but actually it was coined by Nathan Klein and uh, Manfred Kleins. And actually we, I went to meet Manfred Kleins in California. He's like an old man with a long beard uh, sitting there in the, uh, in the vineyards. And we went to talk to him about this word. And actually they created this word because they had the need that they, there, was an, uh, there was mechanical and bionic and they needed this other word. And actually they, dis they coined this word to define people that had to modify themselves in order to survive in other environments. So if you had to to survive in a space rather than create, create a spaceship and live there, we should modify ourselves in order to survive in a space. So that was the idea of Cyborg. And he was actually very angry at how this word has been used in many science fiction films because now well, maybe not now, but in the I guess some years ago, everyone that thought a cyborg, they they thought about Terminator and very terrible things. So he actually wanted to sue Hollywood films, but I, th I think he didn't. So since this word has been coined, it has been used in many in many different ways, and and everyone and I think words keep evolving. So from the Cyber Foundation, we thought, okay. We can define uh, three ways of being a cyborg or identify yourself as a cyborg. And we thought one could be a psychological cyborg, which is the feeling of being united to technology. Maybe most of you are already psychological cyborgs. When your mobile phone is running out of battery, say, I'm running out of battery, instead of saying, my mobile phone is running out of battery. So you treat your phone as it was part of yourself. 
so you're really psychologically connected to technology. Maybe one could be a biological cyborg, which is the physical union between the technology and yourself. And one could be a neurological cyborg, which is the modification of the mind and the brain because you've been united to technology for so long. Also, apart from identifying myself as a cyborg, I identify myself as a trans species because I have this new sense and this new organ that is no longer defined as a human sense, as a human organ. There are many people that don't feel 100% human. I don't feel 100% human because I to semiotics, but there's a lot of people that don't feel 100% human for other reasons. Uh, a good example of who feels trans species is my friend Neil. He has a, an antenna implanted in his skulls that transform colors into sound waves. So, so he perceives from infrared to ultraviolet through vibrations in his skull. And you can, s he's more f uh, a visual uh, example of transpecies because he has an antenna. An antenna an is not a human organ, it's more an animal organ. And actually, this when he went to, he wanted to implant his antenna, so he went to a hospital. Uh, and then he said, he asked for this surgery and the doctor said, okay, you have to talk to a bioethical, bioethical committee. And then he went and he gave a talk to the bioethical committee. And at the end, they decided that, that no, that they wouldn't do this surgery. And basically, they, the, s the reasons that they gave him to not have this surgery was that it was unnecessary, uh, that it could be dangerous, and they were worried about the image. If someone would walk in as a normal guy and then come up with an antenna. And then we found a bit of parallelism with the transgender community on the 20s and 30s. Actually, if someone was a man and felt like a woman when they had to do surgery, the reasons that they said no was the same one, that it wasn't necessary, that it could be dangerous, and they were worried about the image if someone walk in as a man and come out as a woman. So we hope in the future would be very normal to have uh, cyborg surgeries and n have new people with new body parts and senses. Uh, actually, in last year, last year, yeah, last year in December, we founded the Transpecies Society, which is more like the social organization of the Science Foundation. We have a lab in in Barcelona, and we do. We also give voice to people that don't feel a hundred percent human. We we do artist residency to create new organs. We have a lab where we create new projects, in and and events, and yeah, there's lots of beer also there when we do events. So like, we have this in common. <coughs> and one of the projects that, we, that, we, that I've done, it's, it's okay, uh, so I have it. Uh, so we went, in, we went back it in Brazil two years ago for, for a week we, to work with 16 very talented people. And actually, I have a tooth missing, and Neil has two tooth missing. And then we, we decided that maybe they could do a tooth for us, that it would, do, that it would be more than a tooth. So uh, so we decided, uh, so I had, I'm the one on the right, so I, was, I had like a, um, I like a prototype of a tooth here, and then Neil had another one. And whenever I click, he would feel a vibration, and whenever he click, I would feel a vibration. And we both know the Morse code, because we had to learn from performance, so we were, I will, we were able to communicate to each other by clicking our mouth, to the rhythm of our mouth. And we call this a transcendental communication system because we're able to talk to each other from tooth to tooth. And we did a little demonstration after that week. So I was sitting at the end of a table and he was sitting in the other end of the table and the audience would write a word and it would be like. And then he would feel and then he would write a word. So it was the, our first experiment of this type of communication. And actually, it's a communication that maybe could work for people that cannot move uh, at all or maybe also in a space because you don't need air to communicate to, through each other. And it was, it was done with Bluetooth, so it was actually a Bluetooth tooth. And we like that. <laughs> so <laughs> he's, he's a, my cyborg friend also, he's a cyborg artist, he's Manel, and we founded the Transpeace Society with him. And he's like a, in a prototype to do some ears that vibrate depending on uh, of the atmospheric pressure. So depending if the atmosphere, uh, the pressure is high or low, he would feel different vibrations in his ears. So if you know the atmospheric pressure, you, kn you can know if it's gonna rain or not. So he's actually the weatherman. He feels the weather in his ears. Some other projects that we do, was that we do is the air quality sense. So this, 
this boy is developing this so he can know if the uh, air is very polluted or not and this maybe can change our ways of going home maybe to choose the, m the less polluted way i think malmo is quite okay today i walk around and it felt very pure compared to barcelona the air uh, as i told you like neil had another space so he created a, lo uh, a light tooth so whenever he clicked, he could create light inside his mouth. So he said it was useful, like if, he, if you lose your keys in your bag, you can click and have <laughs> internal light. But then he said, when I'm, when I'm eating, the light comes, goes in and on. So, so we have to find another way to create internal light. Um, another one, this we did a, a workshop in, in the south of France, and this, uh, this was a work of a student. And this part of the body, it's called the solar plexum. And he designed this prototype to feel the heat of the sun, so because sometimes the the sun changes his heat, so you are like connected to to the heat of the sun and to know the solar if there are solar flares or not. This is like a magnetic hair implant, so actually if you to feel the magnetic fields with your hair, so if you would if you would walk past on a fridge, your hair would move. So it's like <laughs> interactive hair. I <Actually>, too <laughs> when we I, I met the the mayor of of. Medellin some some weeks ago and he's a bit bold and he was very interested in this. <laughs> he was like, imagine the first ma cyborg man with magnetic hair. Um, this uh, we have another another artist who's, who wants to feel the cosmic rays, so the the rays that come from space through uh, through sound. Uh, he he will do it. He's still in process doing the prototype. Uh, we did this some weeks ago. He's actually doing the retroception, the one that feels presence behind but also to feel uh, if there's not a real presence, just like more energy, and he feels the vibrations in the cheekbones. So this, we did it in, in our lab. Um, and also this is the recent project of Neil. He's actually creating a solar crown. So it would be a point of heat that will take 24 hours to go around his head. We all have a sense of time, but uh, we actually don't have an organ to sense time. So he wants to create an organ to sense time and and to to feel like really the time how it is, like to feel the same, the same the the how, how the sun is rotating the Earth. So he will uh, know what time is it depending of the points of the heat. So when he w and he says that maybe when he gets used to feeling all this uh, all that all this time, maybe in the future he will be able to do time illusions in the same way we do optical illusions. Maybe if if he wants a uh, moment to last shorter because it's very boring, maybe he would be able to m to modify his own perception of time. It's a, a still in process, an experiment he wants to do. And this is uh, something that we did some months ago. Uh, this this is a bit different. Uh, actually, I don't know if you told, but uh, this is a study that said that humans used to perceive the magnetic north many years many years ago, but we lost this sense. And actually, uh, it's there's a study that says that we used to feel it in the back of our knees. So we did this for a for a festival. Actually, we we tried to to wake up this dormant sense. So what we did was to to implant the inter the what is inside a compass to see if we could wake up this dormant sense and to feel the the magnetic north, how we used to do it. Uh, we all three have it, and we still don't know where the north is. But we that we. It was an experiment, we tried it. Maybe we need also the other leg, uh, we'll probably do it, I'm not sure. Um, actually, all, all these sensors uh, help us to, to understand how, uh, how our planet is and to, to be more connected to our planet. Now that I'm as a cyborg, I don't feel closer to robots or to machines, I actually feel closer to Earth and to the planet because I can feel that it's shaking. Uh, constantly, also maybe through other species, because I can relate how he, how they perceive reality in a deeper way. Sometimes when when we think of what we could perceive, uh, we don't need to think about science fiction or very unnatural things. If we take a look at nature and other species, we can get very very inspired. I mean, other species can can fly. Some animals can create infrared and ultraviolet. Uh, some animals can create light by themselves. And even immortality already exists in nature because there's a jellyfish that never dies and keeps regenerating. So I think we should admire and learn from other species living in this planet. 
Um, also, what, what we think is do it's like it's, it has nothing to do with vir virtual reality or mental re reality. We feel that we do real reality or reveal reality because with these new senses, we reveal a reality that it's around us, but we cannot perceive uh, because of the sense. So if you have a new sense, you reveal a reality that, that exists, but we cannot perceive. Uh, yeah, and just uh, we we also feel like maybe humans have been changing the environment and the planet for hundreds and hundreds of years in order to be more comfortable. And maybe we have arrived in a time that it would be much better to design ourselves in order to live more according to our planet needs. Maybe if we had been more conscious that the Earth was constantly moving, we wouldn't have been building cities at the edge of the tectonic plates that actually are very dangerous places to live. Uh, if we all had night vision, like all the species have, maybe we wouldn't need artificial light, and maybe we could have half of the planet in the darkness, how it, it, it really is, and the energy that we use would be much less. If we could all control maybe our own heating in less uh, and, and not use heaters or air conditioning, then we wouldn't have to cool down or heat up the, the whole planet. It would be just our own thing. So maybe we, ha we arrived in a year that we should design more ourselves and leave uh, Earth a bit of a breath and, and peace. And my current project is actually to connect to the seismic activity of the moon. So this will allow me to be physically on Earth but having my feet on the moon. And uh, because the moon also shakes through moonquakes, they are less often than the earthquakes, but they last longer. So I'm really looking forward uh, to do that. And we call this to be actually a sense astronaut. We no longer need to be an astronaut and go physically on a space in order to explore it. We can remain on Earth and have a new sense to explore space, which is more comfortable, I think. So we can all have a new sense to explore space and have this uh, experience on, on like a really extended perception of reality. And also think, yeah, maybe the, the aim of the 20th century was the man going to the moon, but maybe in this century the aim is like to bring the moon to us. And just to end, uh, I just want to, to tell you to make sure that um, we are the ones who need to make sure that the union between humans and technology doesn't alienate us from nature or to other animals. I mean, we are the ones who need to make sure that actually the union between humans and technology can bring us closer to nature, to other species, and also to space. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> So, so before um, we go on with anything, what what are your feet saying right now? Quiet. Quiet. Ready to dance. Ready to. <laughs> <d> <laughs> so, if you've seen that moon goes crazy on the dance floor, <laughs> it's because there is an earthquake somewhere in the world. Um, officially blown away. Um, like, what would you like the audience to leave with? Having you know, you're doing this exploration. How can we bring this down to again software developers? What is it that you would, you know, what is the thing that you want to pass on to, 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 to the audience of? Yeah, okay, yeah, maybe actually it's something that always happens, like when we do a workshop, everyone is always trying to help the others, which is not bad, but it's just like, okay, I'm going to do something for the blind, I'm going to do something for the deaf, and I think, but you're not blind or deaf, I mean, that doesn't mean that you cannot do things, but it's, I think, if we think more personally about our experience, then in the later we can help. So I guess, I think it's more, I think it's just this idea of excitement that everyone can design their own perception. That I, for me, was relevant to perceive earthquakes, but what is for you relevant? I mean, I imagine going to a bar in 50 years and apart from asking where you're from, I would ask what sense do you have? I think it's more excited that we, we can all have our own senses and our own perceptions that it can be very very different mm. so you're offering the audience when they go out onto the dance floor for them to explore a new sense yeah to, th to think what would you like to feel yeah. that you don't mm. and then and then it's like and some people say i don't know and then it's and then the next uh, answer would be uh, get inspired by the other animals because compared to a bee, a dog, or any other animal, our experience of the world is very different because of our senses. Mm. 
Yeah, and you were saying that when we were talking that by doing all of this, you've felt much more connected to to the earth and and the future. What what are you seeing? I think I, I my my hope is that actually, for me, like being more connected, it, it makes me maybe understand more uh, and create more empathy towards the earth animals. So I hope that the union between humans and technology makes make us create more empathy and learn how to live in our own planet. That I feel that humans don't know how to live in our own planet. They're destroying it a bit. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a downer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say get that. Can you lift us up now? Like, can you just finish yeah. on? Because I, I can't finish yeah, I mean on that. The, the finish is that we, we have a choice that, <laughs> yeah. that we we are the ones who decide how to use this technology. So make it a good, make a it good, good use. choice. Yeah. yeah. So please give this explorer a massive <laughs> round of applause for doing all the amazing work. Thank you.